last week on our series of learning to lead in the book of Nehemiah. There's a lot more in Nehemiah, okay? But I'm going to finish, finish it up for now uh, on this part. Next week I'm going to preach on why missions is essential to you and to the life of a church. One of the things that I heard at our meeting on Thursday is uh, only 17% of our Assembly of God churches in New Jersey support missions on a regular basis. Mind-boggling. Another statistic, and 80% of our churches are plateaued and declining. I'm not a statistician. This is not hard to figure out. We're growing, thriving, and the churches that are giving, you can look at the list, they have the list, growing and thriving, and those that give nothing to missions, including their pastor, right? Like if nothing zero comes in, the pastor's not even giving, and their churches are struggling, declining, and closing. It's not difficult to see. Okay, that's sermon for next week, sorry. I get all excited about this, because I'm excited what God has done. I can't wait to tell you some of these things that we've seen. Uh, and, and heard. But I want to finish up with uh, Nehemiah today, and I want to talk about the great theological treatise called Winnie the Pooh and Friends. Okay? How many know Winnie the Pooh? Love Winnie the Pooh. I want to be Winnie the Pooh someday where I eat so much I can't fit through the window anymore. Uh, he just eats and he just gets stuck and they all push. And it'll be fun. It'll be a church project. Can we get Pastor uh, through the door? Uh, once Joe's married, end of July, I can start being happy again. I, I really have that date marked. And not just for the wedding, which we're thrilled, thrilled, but I'll be able to eat again and be my normal happy, happy self uh, in that. So, uh, so Winnie the Pooh. What are some of the characters in Winnie the Pooh? Tigger, Owl, Piglet, Eeyore, Piglet. Well, Christopher Robin, of course. He's probably the leader in it. Okay, so here's one of the characters I want to show you. And I want to show you a little video um, of this character that is the antithesis of leadership, all right? So let's watch this video and we'll talk about it in just a minute. Good morning, Pooh Bear. If it is a good morning, which I doubt. However, yeah, now. did I get your tail back on properly, Eeyore? No matter. Most likely lose it again anyway. Poor dear. You know, I may have just the thing. Up, up, up you go. <laughs> there you are. It's an awful nice tail, Kanga. Much nicer than the rest of me. It's not much of a tail but I'm sort of attached to it. Not much of a house. Just right for not much of a donkey. <laughs> Might take a day or two, but I'll find a new one. End of the road. Nothing to do. And no hope of things getting better. Sounds like Saturday night at my house. <laughs> Just like I'm not sure how you can be an Assemblies of God church that was birthed in missions and not support missions, I don't know how you can be a born-again believer saved from all of your sins, filled with the Holy Spirit, destined for eternal glory, and be an Eeyore. Right? You certainly can't be a leader. If you notice that Eeyore never led anything, in fact, what happened in most of his time were they were always trying to overcompensate for his pessimism. So now I'm not going to draw too much in this, okay? But what can happen is, is when there's an Eeyore in the, the group, the group tends to tr focus all of their attention on Eeyore, who's probably not going to change, while missing other opportunities to fulfill what they're really called to do. I don't know what Pooh's high calling was, okay? But I'm saying this can happen in, in any situation. And if we're talking about leaders, we know that Eeyore was not the leader in any way. Because in sunshine, he could find fault. In food, he could find something 
wrong. It didn't matter what was going on. Um, Eeyore was never, never a leader. He was pessimistic, gloomy, unmotivated. Um, you just can't be a leader and be an Eeyore. It doesn't work that way. Uh, instead, what we have opportunity to be is godly leaders that love God and love others, godly leaders that are filled with joy, and godly leaders that lead others into joy. And that's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to say this publicly, and I hope that it is fulfilled. I'm going to try to preach a little shorter today because we have the business meeting afterwards. I'm going to try, okay? I'm going to try. So let's break this down. Three simple and easy points. Number one, a godly leader loves God and loves others. We know that Nehemiah loved God because we can see all throughout what we've studied, he was constantly in prayer. And he was able to hear from God. He had more than just a ritual uh, 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 relationship with God Almighty. He had a personal relationship with God Almighty. That he talked to God, God talked to him, because Nehemiah loved God. But we also know that Nehemiah loved other people. And this is an important part of understanding that the project is not the main goal of leadership. People are the main goal of leadership, okay? The project is not the most important thing. The people are the most important thing. Obviously, this relates uh, to church, but it also relates into the workplace. If you have people that work for you, if you're pouring into their lives and they're better, everyone is elevated by that. If your people are unmotivated and uh, angry and, and hateful uh, because of poor leadership, then they're not going to accomplish as much as they would in other situations. So we see that Ezra and Nehemiah were contemporaries. Ezra was a scribe. Nehemiah was not a, uh, what do I want to say, vocational minister in that regard, but he was a leader and a godly leader. He was a person not called to full-time ministry, but he was called to lead, and he was a godly leader. Ezra was a scribe that was uh, important in the rebuilding of the temple. And then in the second part of Ezra was the rebuilding of the people. Once the temple was rebuilt, then there was an emphasis on rebuilding the spiritual life of the people because not as important, this is tricky in, in Judaism, but it's true, not as important was the temple as what the temple would help the people do, which in their time was to worship God. Okay, so the project wasn't more important than the people. And then Nehemiah, after the temple was rebuilt and they still fell away from the Lord, Nehemiah, it was time to build the walls, but it wasn't the project that was important, it was the people. So the first part of Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls, the second part of Nehemiah is rebuilding the people. And that's where we're going to be in chapter 8 today. Ultimately, projects are about people. It's not just for us, although it is, but for us as a church, all of the projects and all of the things that we work on, whether it's a one day event such as ax throwing, we'll call that a project that went very well. Steve even brought it out when he was just given a simple announcement. It was great to get together with other guys and get to know them a little bit better. It's ultimately not about axes or even pizza. It's about people. See, everything that we do is about people, okay? In all of the projects that we've done here at the church through the years, it's, it's not about the project, it's about the, the, the people. We're doing some renovations downstairs, we're making the children's room bigger because we've outgrown the children's room to the glory of God. I would also like to give glory to God that He hasn't called me to be a children's pastor. <laughs> wow. That would probably lead to prison ministry from the inside out and not the outside in. <laughs> but thank God we have people that love children and do a wonderful job of teaching them. I don't know if you know this, but Pastor Rick, each service takes time to walk around the whole building just to check on things, make sure everything's okay. And he, appropriately so, he sits back there so he can go in and out without causing a disruption. But he does that so he can see what's going on. 
I don't remember what week it was. I was here and I wasn't preaching for some reason. I don't remember, but it wasn't too, too long ago. And so I had the opportunity to walk around a little bit. And I didn't go all the way into the children's room because I didn't want to take the focus away and be a distraction. And I heard Kelly teaching the children great biblical truths on a level they could understand. And what was so exciting was the tremendous participation. Now it was loud, but it was enthusiastic. It was loud, but it wasn't disruptive or rebellious. It was enthusiastic about the things of God. That's why we tear down a wall to make the room bigger. It's not about the project, it's about the, the people. You see, I looked in on John's uh, Sunday school class this morning and they were finishing up in prayer and I was just looking in the window and it wasn't just a, and I wasn't in there, didn't hear anything. But, and, uh, but I don't think I'm wrong in this. It was a, a meaningful time of prayer where people entered in. Am I right in that? And that God was working through that. I could sense it through the doors. Okay? We built the cafe not for the project, but for the people. That people could go and have fellowship, but also have time of prayer, be it on a Tuesday, be it on a Sunday, be it on a Wednesday or something else. See, it's never, as godly leaders, it's never about the project. It's always about the people. And the people we can reach, or I like to say it like this, the people we can help grow in their relationship to the Lord, because that includes everybody. Those that have never met the Lord, those that have been serving the Lord, we all want to grow in our relationship to the Lord. It's never about the project. It's always about the people. And that is where leadership stems from, loving God, loving people. Love God, love your neighbor, the two greatest commandments. You see how that comes together? That came together in Nehemiah's life, that he loved God and he loved people. And he loved the Israelite people, and they weren't always easy to love, right? There's a story I'm not going to get to at the end of it. Now, <laughs> I love this story and I put it on Faith Life. I wrote a little article on it. He comes back and they were not serving the Lord the way they should. So he beat them and pulled their hair out. And I'm thinking, that's a serious dude right there, man. <laughs> wow, we are not going to be voting on that or instituting that here at the church. Um, no matter how many times Ron brings an ax to church, we are not gonna let him use it. Uh, and his nephew was excited, wasn't he? When they stood, his nephew was clapping and everything. That was so cute. Yeah, but Nehemiah was a serious dude. But he loved God and he loved the people. And you look and you say, well, how could he love the people if he beat them and pulled their hair out? Well, because they were in direct disobedience to the known will of God. And they were bringing shame, but also sin in. And he loved the people enough to hold them accountable. See, love isn't just, oh, you're, everything's fine, you're wonderful, and you can do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do, and whatever feels right to you. That's not love. That's not love at all. Love stands for truth. And there is truth, and it's Jesus, and God's truth. You know? And so, Nehemiah loved them when he was encouraging them using any means necessary. <laughs> Number two, a godly leader is filled with joy. Eeyore never inspired anyone. That video made me nervous just watching it, and I've seen it through a few times because I looked for a few videos this week. He never inspired anyone. See, true joy comes from a right relationship with God. From there flows purpose. When we have right relationship with God, we understand that our, our purpose is bigger than ourselves. And then from that purpose then flows production. So you can go passion, purpose, and then production. And sometimes we focus on production. Now watch this, if we get it mixed up, we focus on production and not purpose, and we end up building something or doing something that doesn't mean anything in the long run. You see? We have to understand what our purpose is, or we could be producing something that really doesn't matter in the long run, or we can be producing something wrong. And so it has to flow in a certain order, passion, based on facts, remember he wept over what was happening. He found his purpose, and then he led them to be able to produce the results, which was to finish the wall. There's a story, maybe you've heard it, of three bricklayers. After the great fire in London in 1666, 
I don't know if any of you remember that or not. Maybe some in the back row uh, back there. Uh, not you, Debbie. I'm sorry. I know it's close to your birthday. When's your birthday, Debbie? It was Thursday. It was Thursday. So she might have been born in 19, or 1666. I don't know, because I would never ask her her age. I would never do that. I'm just teasing. So this happened in 1666. There was a, a fire that leveled London, and they wanted to rebuild St. Paul's Cathedral. And so they uh, got the most famous architect at the time, Christopher Wren. One day in 1671, he was observing and he watched three brook, bricklayers on a scaffold. One crouched, one standing half and halfway up and one standing tall, working very hard and very fast. And so he asked the first bricklayer, what are you doing? To which he replied, I'm a bricklayer. I'm working hard laying bricks to feed my family. The second bricklayer said, I'm, I'm a builder and I'm building the wall. But the third and most productive of all of the three, when asked what he was doing, he says, I'm a cathedral builder and I'm building a great cathedral for Almighty God. See, there's a difference between laying bricks to finish a project to get paid, laying bricks to build a wall, and laying bricks to build a cathedral for God's glory and for the good of people. The third one was the one that ultimately was elevated to be the leader of his whole crew. Why? Because he saw things differently. And when he came to work, I would just imagine because he had a higher purpose, there was joy included in that. Just doing what I, here's Eeyore. Just doing what I got to do to survive. Hope I make it through another day. Don't know if I'm going to do it. But the cathedral builder for the glory of God was like, we're doing something that's going to live on long after we're gone. Now, Keith, I, 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 when I emphasize the children, it's not at the expense of others, but we're all older here. That's why I emphasize it in this, in this setting. When you see the children come up and they go down and they have everything they need to learn about God in a way that they can understand it, why are we doing that? Because we're cathedral builders. We don't just have children's ministry. I get the kids out of the sanctuary so they're not as, so noisy. Give their parents a break. They probably need it. No, we're poor. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. You're welcome. Oh, the boss going to be mad at you. We're building lives that we pray will be impacted for generations to come, just like our lives for those of us that grew up in church were impacted. I had a Sunday school teacher, her name was Dorothy Casto. How many met her, know her? You know who knew her? Jesus. And when she got to the throne, he said, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into my joy. Because Dorothy Casto put up with me, <laughs> first of all. I know it's hard to believe, but I, I may or may not have been a bit of a rascal in the day. That's an old word, isn't it? Rascal? Troublemaker? I was hiding under the table uh, one time, and I remember this clearly, and they couldn't get me out from under the table. Come on, get out, get out. And I wasn't, I was like 20. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it all ended suddenly when they said, do you want us to get your father? No, ma'am. Anyway, Dorothy Casto. I remember we had sanctuary. It was somewhat similar to this. It was built in 1966. This was built in 1960. So we didn't have the barrel roof, but we had the pointed and with the wood slats. And up in the back where, where we have our sound booth was a Sunday school classroom. And you'd go up the steps, and there was no windows or anything. And there'd be three or four of us there. And she would teach us the word of God week in and week out. And when you hear me quote scriptures in the King James, a lot of that is because of Dorothy Casto. Because she understood she wasn't just, she, somebody's got to do something with these kids. I'm pouring God into these kids. That someday, maybe generations later, they can impact other lives. Joy. The godly leader has joy because they haven't lost perspective. I don't know where I'm going to have this in here. Um, 
The godly leader has joy. The, the godly leader leads others toward joy. That's point number three. And here's our verse. You, you need to know this, at least most of it. Write it down. Highlight it. Whatever it is. Nehemiah 8.10. Anybody have any idea what it is? Probably the only verse we know in Nehemiah. The joy of the Lord is our what? Yeah, see. So let me give you context on it. Nehemiah 8.10 says this. Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with the feast of rich foods and sweet drinks, and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before the Lord. Don't be dejected and sad. Don't be an Eeyore today, for the joy of the Lord is your what? Is your strength. So the wall had been rebuilt, and so they called for Ezra, the scribe, to come and read the law. And then the Levites, the priests, after he would read the law word for word, would explain the law to the people. And when they heard the law because they were so far from God and had forgotten the law, the people were weeping because of their sins. They recognized how far from God they were. And that, that, that their relationship to God was not based on their nationality, but it was based on their obedience to the known will of God and their belief in God and their faith in God. And so they wept and they wept because of their sins, and rightfully so. There is a time for us as believers to mourn. Now, I'm talking differently than when we've suffered a loss. So when I say mourn, this is a kind of a different sort of a thing. What I'm talking about is mourning for our own sins. There is a time in our life where we must mourn because of our sins. But here's the point. There is a time, but it's not for the rest of our lives. There's a time to repent of our sins, to receive the forgiveness of God, and then what comes next? The joy. See, we don't live in constant fear of God hating, hating us or condemning us. We're Christians. He sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. We've received him by faith. We've been forgiven of all of our sins, no matter what friends, family, or the enemy puts in our minds. We have been forgiven because of Jesus Christ. And what comes from that joy? Is there a time of mourning? Yes, but it's only for a night. For joy comes in the morning. Once they confessed and repented of their sins, God forgave them. You know, if you've confessed and repented of your sins, God has forgiven you. And you are no longer a sinner in God's eyes. You are a saint in God's eyes. You don't have to mourn every day for your past mistakes and your past sins. You can rejoice in knowing that you're forgiven by God himself. And what happens when the enemy attacks? You have the strength to overcome the enemy because you know the joy of the Lord. One translation, and it's, it's appropriately so, it says not that uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength, but the joy of the Lord is our stronghold. That the joy of the Lord is our fortress. That the joy of the Lord is our wall of protection around us. Isn't that interesting? That he had just built a wall to protect the people from the physical enemies. And now he was telling them that the joy of the Lord would protect them against their spiritual enemies. It's a stronghold around us, this joy that we have. There's a time for mourning, but it's not forever. There's a time for repentance. There's a time for joy. Celebrate, 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 celebrate. Some believers never get to the celebration. They live a life in constant mourning because they are somehow unable to receive the forgiveness and the blessings of the Lord. You weren't forgiven because you've earned it. You don't live in his joy because you've earned it. It's all by grace, and that grace is extended to each and every one of us. Amen? So we celebrate. And so when they were celebrating, Nehemiah told them to do what? What's it say? Don't mourn. This day is holy, sacred to the Lord. Here's what I want you to do. What's it say? Eat. All right, so let's break this down a little bit. If you were preparing a feast of celebration, if you were preparing a feast 
of celebration. Just one thing, just one thing, what would you have at your feast? What's that? What kind of pasta? Any kind is good. Amen to that. Somebody else. What's that? Brisket. Oh, brisket. Oh, we had uh, Thursday for the ministers, Mission Barbecue. You ever had that? Mission Barbecue, phenomenal. Listen, if you're listening, want to sponsor something, let us know. We'll put your little plaque up uh, for $10,000. Anyway, or just bring me a sandwich once a week and we're good. Yeah, brisket, good. Ribs, I didn't think of that. What else? Cake. Tenderloin. Who said tenderloin? <laughs> Glory to God. Stromboli. That's a good one, too. Fried chicken. What sides? No, what would you also have besides the fried chicken? Mashed potatoes. Mashed potatoes, gravy. Somebody said coleslaw. Coleslaw. My wife is still angry at Chick-fil-A, by the way. And you know why? Yeah, they took coleslaw away and they put kale salad. Who was the executive that made that decision? They run everything to perfection. The greatest fast food restaurant that humanity has ever seen. But somebody decided, no more coleslaw. Hey, let's have kale. No. There is no kale at this feast, and there will be no kale at the wedding supper of the Lamb. All right, so here's my feast. Are you ready? You think you're ready, but you're really not. I said this at the, at the online service, and I said, you're going to hear all this food, but you, when we're done, you can go to your fridge and do something about it. When I preach it on site, you've got a ways to go yet before you get home. So, so I, at my feast... I'm going to have pizza, wings, and cheesesteaks, okay? I'm meeting with a missionary on Tuesday the 14th, the one that's going to speak to the prayer warriors. He's from Kentucky, okay? I'm taking him afterwards for cheesesteaks to the glory of God. We would have pasta. No, these aren't the only three things. This is a feast. This is like a, the other three things are like a men's event. No, this is a, this is a feast. I would have pasta. Probably spaghetti and meatballs, but, but rigatoni is also a big favorite. Do you know what rigatoni are? How many of, our, of, of, of the Gentiles that are here know what rigatoni is? A couple of you? She don't count. She eats pineapple on her pizza. <laughs> rigatoni with the, with the sauce and meatballs, underrated. Beautiful meal. Beautiful meal. We'd have that. Italian bread, fresh out of the oven. Okay, now that's important. I like when it comes to the table, it's still steaming, and then you cut it. And here's the other part of it that I've added to the feast. Whipped butter, Amen. and not frozen butter, okay? You get this beautiful bread with frozen butter, and it just tears it to shreds. Whipped butter at this feast, because we're celebrating the Lord. Lasagna, would have to have lasagna. Have to have Italian wedding soup. Italian wedding soup is not escrow soup. Italian wedding soup is another level, okay? It's another level of heaven, Italian wedding soup. How many have had Italian wedding soup? How many could go for some Italian wedding soup right now with that warm bread and, yeah, yeah, me too, me too. If I was a better pastor, I would have some for you. Uh, I mentioned pizza, wings, pasta, tacos. My feast is also going to have tacos. Uh, how many like tacos? Taco Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Good. We like tacos. I think one of our Wednesday fellowships is going to be Taco Wednesday. I don't know. Okay. Now we're going to move towards dessert. Linda, anything you want to say about dessert? <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, big plates. <laughs> big plates. <laughs> Linda, these little things aren't going to cut it. No, 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 no. What is this, she says. She goes over to the, after she's knocked over three people, she gets to the thing and she says, what is this? Big plates. What, what would you have on that big plate out of anything, you know, with no consequences? Wendy's coconut cake. Okay. That'll be good for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, missions dinner. 
Don't you think? How many? I'd like it. I'd like to make a motion that, that Wendy makes her coconut cake. A uh, second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Good. How many do I pick? Just one, for me and Linda. <laughs> they voted. We didn't say we were going to share. I mean, it's a, there's no problem in that. So I would have, I would have this. If you remember uh, Sam and Ruth Ann Chapana, of Stella's brother, sister-in-law, they always treated us so well. Funny story uh, about them too. They would go and pick up my parents from the train if I wasn't able to go, but it was before cell phones, and so they wouldn't be back for hours. They'd get home. I'd be like, "Where are my parents?" You know. And Sam gets out of the car and goes, "Oh, we couldn't pick them up without taking them out to eat." They'd take them to some Italian restaurant and. Door would have a dinner prepared, and they're like, oh, no, we're full because they fed us so much. But anyway, they, they would, we would go to Pegasus after church on Sunday night, and, and I would get a warm waffle with ice cream and strawberries on top of it. That will be at the Feast of Celebration. Plus, cannolis will be there. Cheesecake. Cheesecake with multiple toppings. I don't like cheesecake that everything's blended into it. I like plain cheesecake with toppings. So there'll be multiple toppings. Uh, I do like cheesecake with things blended in, but it, 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 if I had my first case. And then apple pie a la mode. Simple, American, often underrated. This is a feast. I have a point here besides making you all hungry. Listen, this is important. Listen. It's okay to celebrate the goodness and the graciousness and the provision of Almighty God. Just don't forget those that have nothing prepared for them. I don't know why we fell into, not here at this church, but I don't know why we fall into this Eeyore mode of, oh, why we, we shouldn't have this for the... Why shouldn't we celebrate what God has done in our life? Now, I probably shouldn't eat like that every day. I probably shouldn't. July 24th, I'm going to give it a shot, see how it goes. Okay? But why shouldn't we as believers get together and rejoice in the goodness of God? Because even when we have our dinners, and which we do, and we have our Wednesday night things, and there's food and everything, to me, honestly... It's still all about the people. It's about giving glory to God. It's about saying, God, thank you for, for providing our day-to-day -day needs. And we take this opportunity to celebrate you. Old Testament, how did they remember the goodness of God? Feasts. And I'm not even kidding about that. Aren't all of the things that they were told to remember and to do over and over again, weren't they all feasts? And they didn't last for a, a couple hours on a Saturday night. They lasted for a week because even a week is not enough to celebrate the goodness and the greatness of God. Why am I saying this? There's a time for mourning for our sins and there's a time to receive his forgiveness and to rejoice that we're forgiven. And now he's filled us with joy that overflows, that touches others' lives, that's a fortress and stronghold and strength for us to overcome the difficulties in life. We, as believers, should not be Eeyores, but we should be the people of joy. Does it mean that we don't go through difficult times? No. Does it mean that we don't have trials like everybody? No. We have trials, we have troubles, and some of those things lead us to tears. But that's not always. There's a time for joy, there's a time for celebration, because God has been so good to us. Leaders lead others to joy. Some people look at a feast and say, look at all that food. Some people look at a feast and say, oh, what a waste. I look at a face, feast and say, oh, what a God. What a glorious and wonderful God. A God who provides. A God who blesses. A God who protects. A God who lavishes his love upon us. 
the God that gives us more than enough. Godly leaders, let the people rejoice, staying focused on the favor of God. Watch this, this is my last big thought. Rejoice by staying focused on the favor of God and not the faults of the people. If you want to lose your joy, begin looking at the faults of other people. If you want to regain that joy, begin to look at the favor of God on your life. You losing your joy is a choice. Cry out as David did, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation in Psalm 51. But as soon as you look at others' faults, you will lose the joy. But you will have joy that will give you strength to make it through whatever you're facing when you remember the favor of God in your life. That's the joy of the Lord. It's on the inside, no matter what's going on on the outside, because of what Jesus has done in our lives. Last thought, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote this, people are like stained glass windows. They sparkle and shine when the sun is out, but when the darkness sets in, their true beauty is revealed only if there is a light within. See, when the sun is shining and everything is going great, the stained glass looks beautiful. But when it's dark outside, circumstantially, what comes out is the light that's inside of you, the light of Jesus Christ, because of what he has done for us and on our behalf on the cross. There is a time for mourning, but that's not forever. There's a time of joy and there's a time of celebration. So watch, when Dorothy Casto, my Sunday school teacher, got to heaven, she was never famous. No one ever knew her outside of her very small circle, but God knew her. And when she met him, well done, my good and faithful servant. What's the next part? Enter into my, what? For the joy of the Lord is our strength. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.